Good afternoon. Uh, in 1980, the Synod of Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia organized a special theological committee in order to resolve a newly arising theological issue. Then deacon, now Archbishop Lazar Puhalo, has accused famous here among Seraphim Rose of heresy. Accusation was based on Father Seraphim's book, The Soul After Death in which he tried to explain popular uh, near-death experience phenomena through the lens of Eastern Orthodox tradition. He presented teaching, uh, especially common to the Russian Orthodox Church, that after the death, the soul passes through 20 aerial tall houses, Mutarstva in Slavonic, Telonia in uh, Greek, in which demons Tax collectors try to find the soul for its unconfessed sins and even to take it to the underworld. This is an icon depicting this teaching. Every toll booth is associated with a different set of sins and vices. According to Father Seraphim, only after the soul passes the toll houses, it reaches the judgment of Christ. It seems to Father Seraphim that parallel traditions in Egyptian, Tibetan, and other religions only prove that this tradition is true. On the contrary, Father Lazar Puhalo claimed that the doctrine of toll houses is foreign to the Christian tradition, and that, uh, and he linked uh, that, I'm sorry, and that links to the uh, Egyptian, Tibetan, and modern near-death experience texts only proved the inclination of Father Seraphim towards heterodox teachings. In particular, Father Lazar Puhala claimed that this teaching is of Gnostic origin <clears throat> and accused Father Seraphim of being Gnostic heretic. In spite of that above-mentioned synod ruled in favor of Father Seraphim and forbade further discussions, this sparked a controversy among various American Orthodox jurisdictions which continues until this day. <clears throat> this paper will uh, focus on the debate among Orthodox theologians in the last 30 years on the origin of Toll House teaching. First of all, let us examine teaching and arguments presented in Father Seraphim's book, The Soul After Death. After analysis of studies concerning near-death experience, Father Seraphim claims that there are three common elements to all uh, descriptions. First, it is separation from body, which is sudden and even surprising to the dying subject. Second, it is a meeting with another being. Third, it is a travel after. According to Seraphim, all these elements are present in Eastern Orthodox tradition. Father Seraphim Rose starts presenting tradition of the Church by angelological and demonological chapters. Following Russian saint Ignatius Brenchaninov, Seraphim claims that angels and demons in fact are paradoxically corporeal beings, which can be seen by humans. He opposes Cartesian body-mind dualism and defends non-physical corporeality of spiritual beings. After that, he defends the non-physical corporeality of heaven and hell claiming that spiritual heaven is truly above, spiritual hell is truly below, and that there is an intermediate aerial sphere between them. According to Seraphim, toll houses objectively exist between heaven and earth in aerial space, but as long as we are in our bodies, or as long as we do not have a special spiritual gift, we cannot see them. In our life, here, every day, we are struggling with invisible demons. Some of them possess a part of us, some of them do not. After our, de our death, all the barriers fall and we face the demons in a final struggle. We want to go up uh, to the heaven to meet Christ, but demons are trying to find what is theirs in the soul to take it down to hell. Everybody, even Theotokos, the mother of God, had to face them. 
but it is easier for saints because they get help from good spiritual beings. Following the example of Saint Ignatius Brenchanilov, Father Seraphim tries to defend this, his thesis by chronologically presenting uh, textual evidence for it from the apostolic age to the modernity. His sources may be categorized in five groups. First, it is Holy Scripture. Second, patristic literature, Greek, Latin, and Russian fathers of Orthodox Church. Third, liturgical texts. Fourth, hagiographies. And fifth, pious legends about experiences of believers. There are two main ways to criticize Father Seraphim's assertions. Uh, either show that he took quotations out of context, or prove that sources itself are not credible. First path was taken by theologians Lazar Puhala and Adnan Trabulsi. The latter was taken uh, by Michael Askul. I will start from Askul's arguments. In his book, The Tall House Myth, The Neo Gnosticism of Father Seraphim Rose, Askul points out that the strongest evidence in Seraphim's book uh, are either taken from pseudo epigraphical or late sources, earliest so called patristic evidence, a homilies of Saint Macarius the Great and a homily of St. Cyril of Alexandria. But both are today widely acknowledged in scholarly community to be apocrypha. Other evidence from first few centuries given by Father Seraphim, such as quotations from the Bible and Apophthegmata Patrum, are at least ambiguous without context. For example, Father Seraphim interprets Exousias and his Epronis, authorities in the aerial realms mentioned in Ephesians 3.10, to be aerial text collecting demons. But if we look to the context, it is clear that Apostle Paul talks about uh, demons faced in ascetical struggle here, not in the afterlife. Same hermeneutical problems apply to Apophthegmata Patrum and liturgical texts. We either clearly can say that the passage is about this life, not afterlife, or we cannot interpret the passage in any way at all. It is worth mentioning that liturgical texts quoted by Father Seraphim are not only ambiguous in their meaning, they are also peripheral in use and lack critical evaluation. If we dismiss above-mentioned sources, the earliest, earliest clear evidence in Orthodox tradition is life of St. Basil the New, written in 10th century. Michael Askell gives only a superficial treatment of imagery used in the text and in the Gnostic sources, especially travels through archons and heavens, and proposes hypothesis that Gnostic Tollhouse teaching through the tradition of Messalianism and Bogomilism could reach 10th century Byzantium and then enter the church. Puhala and Rabulsi tries to prove Gnostic origin of the teaching and its foreignness to the Orthodox tradition by pointing out the points which seems to contradict Orthodox tradition. Puhala stresses three main points. First, it is the role of God's grace in salvation. Second, Christian anthropology, in which a person is body and soul, not simply just soul. Third, highly allegorical depictions of afterlife in Orthodox tradition. According to Puhala, it is contradictory to claim that in spite of God's salvific grace given to the Church of Christ, demons shall have a power to judge deposed Christians. Also, it seems contradictory to him that in Seraphim's doctrine, a soul acts as if it were a whole person, and it accepts the punishment as a person, even for sins committed by body, not by soul. He presented his own compendium of patristic evidence for teaching that there is no transitional place between heaven, hell, and earth. Basically, it was position of St. Mark of Ephesus, in Council of Lawrence, which dealt with Catholic purgatory. Without analogical arguments, Trubulsi also created mariological argument. He analyzed the Russian narrative of their mission, in which Theotokos is told to be afraid of the toll houses 
and weeping in prayer, and Christ himself comes to her to take her soul, uh, uh, so she could pass uh, the toll houses. Russian tradition interprets an icon of the remission as depicting this event. Here you can see the icon. Uh, Christ holds soul of Theotokos in his hand as a baby. According to Trapulsi, it would mean that uh, Theotokos did not uh, believe in God's salvific grace, was not achrande, uh, preneparochnaya, that is immaculate, and she was not kecharitomeni, full of grace, because otherwise there would be no possibility for demons to exercise any po power towards her. But all of the theological arguments fail if instead of Seraphim's interpretation, we take more moderate approach. Both Ilarion Alfeev and Yerotheos Vlachos follow a more moderate, a more common interpretation, which again obscures relation of Tollhouse doctrine to the Orthodox tradition. We will examine this more moderate approach after we will look into non-Christian texts, which could contain evidence for non-Christian origin. Jewish apocryphal tradition contain many texts about travels through heavens, heavenly realms, for example, Book of Enoch, Third Book of Baruch, etc. The relationship of those texts with Tollhouse teaching is indirect, because first of all, some of them do not talk about the afterlife, secondly, they lack imagery of uh, text collecting. There are two texts from Naghamadi Corpus, which are very close to the Tollhouse tradition. First of them is Apocalypse of Paul, second, first Apocalypse of James. It is not impossible that they were known to Saint Epiphanius of Cyprus and mentioned in his writings as heretical, although he might be referring to other writings. First Apocalypse of James mentions tax, tax collectors only once. The focus of text is traveling through archons and struggling along the way. James is forewarned that in one of the archons there are beings who, quote, sit there as, tax, uh, as toll, toll collectors. Not only do they demand toll, but they also take away souls by theft, end of quote. The Apocalypse of Paul is more clear and elaborate in its teaching on toll houses. If we would compare Apocalypse of Paul to the travels of blessed Theodora in the life of St. Basil the New, we would see six important resemblances and four great differences. First resemblance is presence of a young boy who leads a seer into a vision. When the vision starts, angel uh, lead the seer uh, instead of the boy. Both texts uh, talk about books in which sins of a person is, are written. Both texts present conflict between angels and demons for the soul. Demons are judges, accusers, and also witnesses against a soul. Both texts speak about toll houses, tax collecting demons, and that demons can take insolvent souls to hell. And we could say that both texts are anti-Semitic, uh, although Apocalypse of uh, Paul is implicitly, not explicitly anti-Semitic. Uh, Apocalypse uh, of James has a, a broader discourse uh, on Jews. First uh, difference of, uh, between the texts uh, between uh, uh, Life of St. Basil the New and uh, Apocalypse of Paul is uh, that in Life of St. Uh, Basil, Theodora is saved through prayers of St. Basil. Also, Life of St. Basil teaches that in order to clean your soul from debt, you must do Christian deeds, attend the liturgy, fast, pray, partake in sacraments, etc. Third difference, toll booths are not simply gates, they are interpreted allegorically as vices and sins. Fourth difference, life of St. Basil the New stresses the importance of sacramental repentance. If we have in mind Christian overtones in life of St. Basil the New, we might easily understand the more moderate position. As it is quoted by Father Seraphim Rose, one of the book, handbooks 
of dogmatic theology of 19th century states that Orthodox Church has a doctrine of two judgments, private and universal. According to the handbook, toll houses are allegorical depiction on the Church's teaching about private judgment. The same position is defended, defended uh, in contemporary works of Eurotheos Vlachos and Hilarion Alfeo. I would like to summarize by pointing to the conceptual problems obscuring the discussion and by proposing distinctions which would enable to express the positions more clearly. First of all, there is a false dilemma in the debates on the subject which is created by contrasting Gnosticism and Christianity. As Karen King and other scholars point out, Gnosticism is not a monolithic tradition and an identity of Gnosticism is a problem itself. Also, as an example of sociological discourse in Orthodox Christianity shows, uh, that boundaries, uh, the boundaries are quite unclear. That is why it is more useful to treat the question of imagery of tall houses separately from the content content of doctrine. Secondly, we not only have a problem of identity of Gnosticism, we likewise have a problem of identity of Orthodox tradition. There is no dogmatically binding definition of sacred tradition in the Orthodox Church and authors in this debate often use different conceptions of it. That is why they often differ on the selection of sources and inevitable in conclusions. Theologian uh, Michael Pomazansky, in one of his letters, tried to suggest a taxonomy of sources, but this question requires a more fundamental approach. Without the clear definition what is Orthodox Christianity, uh, it is hard to say if Toll House doctrine is a part of it. Usually pro toll houses theologians simply have a broader conception of tradition than anti toll housers. If we follow those distinctions, we can at least firmly say that all house imagery comes into Orthodox Christian culture from sources of Egyptian desert. A allegorical interpretation of toll house uh, doctrine in Orthodox tradition enables to state that it is in culturation of folk beliefs. Folk imagery is semantically transfigured to fit church church's dogmas. Theological content is also radically transformed in literal corporeal interpretation of toll houses proposed by Father Seraphim Rose, although it is unclear how the lastest, lastest variation of the doctrine uh, formed and which theological elements of it come from the Egyptian desert. Lastly, we should be attentive to three ways of possible usage of the term toll houses or anything aerial. It might refer to struggle here, it might refer to the struggle hereafter, it can mean both options. Thank you for listening.